but our eternity. And so God, I pray that you would help me to be out of the way and that your word would come through loud and clear and that if there's one or, a, or many who don't know you, that they would come to know you today and that those who do know you as their Savior already have already placed their faith in your finished work on the cross and in defeating death through your resurrection, that they would live in this community in such a powerful way that others would see there's something different about them and want to know about you. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, indeed, it is, it is exciting to be able to wake up on Easter morning, resurrection morning. And I don't know how you are. I'm kind of a, a visual person. I like to be able to kind of put myself in the mindset of the people that would have been uh, back then. I, I like to kind of put myself in, in the mindset of those ladies that, I know that's, I know that's dangerous to, for a man to put himself in a mindset of a lady, but just bear with me for a second. I like to put myself in the mindset of those ladies who woke up early in the morning and went to the tomb fully expecting to see their Savior still in that tomb. They had perfume and spices ready to anoint the body of Jesus. And they found an empty tomb that day. I like to think about that. And it's like, okay, they went to bed on Friday night, just devastated. The passage we're going to look at today, we're going to start in Luke 23. We'll be in Luke 24. We'll go briefly to 1 Corinthians 15 and Acts 2. We'll spend most of our time in Luke chapter 23. And in 24. But you're going to see that as we go there, you're going to see that from the, ninth, or from, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, which would be about noon to 3 p.m., there's darkness, hopelessness. And it says that our Jesus gave up the spirit or gave up the ghost, he died. And I just want to, I want you for a moment to put yourself in the position of a follower of Jesus back then. This one that you have been following, that you have put your hope in, you have literally seen him placed upon a cross. You have seen him die and you have seen him be taken off of that cross. You have seen him be taken and put into a tomb and you've seen the tomb sealed. And this one who you have looked to for your hope for your salvation. You've got to put yourself in the mindset of those folks back then. They were looking at Jesus not as someone who was going to necessarily just bring spiritual hope and spiritual victory. They were looking as, at Jesus as their military conqueror, as their king, as someone who was going to bring them freedom from the Roman oppression. In him was all of their hope wrapped up. And he's now dead. And you go to bed. I don't know if you've ever had a really hard day before. I've had some hard days. Um, a former student of mine, when I was in Pennsylvania, committed suicide. And I'm telling you, it was hard to go to bed. Because I felt like everything that I knew was destroyed. And can you put yourself in, in the position of the disciples uh, of the women who had followed Jesus from Galilee, can you put yourself back there and all your hopes and all your dreams have just been shattered? It seems like all hope is lost. There is no future as you go to bed. That's what they're thinking. And they wake up on Saturday and you know what? Jesus is still dead. And they wake up on Sunday morning fully expecting that Jesus is still dead. And they go to the tomb and he's alive. Let's look at God's word together. It's amazing. And if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. We're going to be in Luke chapter number 23. I'm going to start in verse number 44. Uh, it says, it was now about the sixth hour. Jesus is already on the cross. It would have been noon. The sixth hour would have been noon. Darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. Now, it's not natural in Israel for it to be dark from noon to 3 p.m., uh, there are some parts of the world where you can find that, but that would not have been natural. This was a supernatural thing that was taking place. And I don't think that it's lost on any of us that as Jesus hangs there on the cross, taking upon himself the sins of all mankind, sin is often represented by darkness. In fact, uh, Jesus says, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And so Jesus hangs there with the weight of the entire world's sin upon him. And darkness 
falls over the entire land for three hours. Now, if you know nothing about God's Word, if you know nothing about the Bible, I want to back up for just a minute. You might not understand why sin is that big of a deal. You might not understand why Jesus needed to go to a cross to pay for your sin and for my sin. So let me back up all the way back to Genesis. That would be the first book in the Bible. All the way back in Genesis, we see that God created the heavens and the earth, and he created everything that was in the earth. He made mankind, and whenever he looked at man by himself, he said, it's not good that man be alone. So he created a helpmeet or a helper for him. That was Eve. And then he put him in this garden. He said, you can eat from any fruit, the fruit of any tree, but you can't eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And yet mankind changed chose to rebel against God they brought sin into the world let me make very clear God did not bring sin into the world mankind brought sin into the world and what sin does is sin separates man from God God's desire was that was and is and will always be to have a relationship with mankind if you were here for the very first time if this is your very first time hearing about Jesus I want you to know this that while your sin separates you from a holy God He desires more than anything else to have a relationship with you. And the way that was made to have a relationship with you is this. Jesus went to the cross and he had to pay the sin debt. What you owe because of your sin. Romans 6, 23 says this. The wages of sin is death. Separation from God. That's what we all deserve. Many of you get a paycheck every week as a result of the hours that you have worked. It's the wage that you get, what you deserve. As the result of the work, you get a certain amount. Well, here's the deal. As a result of your sin, and we are all sinners, here's what you deserve. You deserve, I deserve, to be separated from God for all of eternity. And if nothing was ever done about sin, that is what would take place. And so when you're wondering why did Jesus go to the cross, it was because a sin debt had to be paid. And and there's going to be one of two ways that a sin debt is paid. Either, number one, you're going to try to pay your sin debt on your own. And if you do that, you're going to be separated from God for all of eternity. Or number two, Jesus has already paid your sin debt. He has bought you back from the marketplace of sin, so to speak. And he says, here's the deal. I've already paid. I want you to place your faith and your trust in me. You need, you need salvation to be rescued from your sin. And so Jesus hangs there on the cross. And he's there and there's darkness from noon to 3 p.m. It said the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Now, if you were here last week, we were in Hebrews, and we talked about the temple curtain being torn in two. I'm not going to go back into that today, uh, but you can read about that, Hebrews chapter number 10. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Everybody say this with me. Say, Jesus was dead. When it says that he breathed his last, that was his last breath of air, and Jesus died. It wasn't a hoax, it wasn't a trick, it wasn't some fancy uh, way of convincing everyone. No, he breathed his last breath and he died. Says the centurion, who would have been a Roman soldier at the time, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. One of these men who put him there on the cross looked and said, surely there was something different about this man. He was a righteous man. And when all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. Now, I think that the the soldiers, some of them would have beat their breasts for multiple reasons. Some of them would look at it as, we have, we have, defeated this Jesus this one who and not even a week before this one who had come into Jerusalem and people had tossed their coats down on the road and they had cut down palm branches and thrown it down so that he could have a victorious triumphal entry into Jerusalem they had watched this happen and and now they have seen Jesus be put on the cross and they're like we have beat him he's not going to be able to to bring any victory now he's dead And some of them had that attitude. It says in verse 49, though, But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. 
and watching in such a way that they didn't fully understand. Jesus had tried to prepare them. But you as parents, if you're a parent, you have tried to prepare your children for certain things in life, right? You've tried to let them know, this, hey, this might happen. Your parents have, have probably tried to prepare you for certain things. Uh, maybe you have tried to prepare husbands, tried to prepare your wives for certain things. Wives, your husbands, uh, those of you that have those that work underneath you, prepare your employees. You try to prepare them for what they're going to face. But whenever they actually face it, they usually don't totally understand what's taking place. And that's what was taking place here. Jesus had tried to prepare his followers. He had said, I need to go and to suffer and to die. It must take place. You'll remember even Peter said, no, Lord. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. This needs to happen. It must happen. And so they were watching these things take place. It says that there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council and a good and upright man. He had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb, cut in the rock on which, uh, on, in which no one had yet been laid. And so he's placed in a tomb. We had looked earlier, and he had breathed his last. Everybody say, Jesus was dead. He's now taken down from the cross by a man by the name of Joseph. He is wrapped and he is placed in the tomb. Everybody say this, say Jesus was buried. Jesus was buried. So at this point we have Jesus who has been to the cross. He has been taken off of the cross. He has been wrapped in linen and he has been placed in the tomb. Now for most people, whenever this happens, it's the end. They have died and they have bur been buried. And we have all experienced that with relatives or friends. It says that it was preparation day. That would have been Friday. And the Sabbath was about to begin. The Sabbath would have been Saturday. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. And so if you wonder, how did the women know where to go? Right here, they had followed him. They saw where Joseph had placed Jesus' body. How it was laid in the tomb. It says in verse 56, Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. But they rested on the Sabbath, that would have been Saturday, in obedience to the commandment. Chapter, or chapter 24, verse number 1, it says this, On the first day of the week, that would be Sunday. We're gathering to, to, together today on a Sunday. We, we get together each week on a Sunday. Why? Because we celebrate what Jesus has done, that he has conquered death. So they, they go on the first day of the week, very early in the morning. The women took the spices that they had prepared. Remember in the previous verses that they had prepared spices and perfumes. And so they took those and they went to the tomb. Verse number two, they found the stone rolled away. You can find in previous gospel accounts how that the, the soldiers uh, had received uh, orders that they were supposed to seal and guard the tomb because they didn't want anybody coming in and making this appear as if Jesus raised from the dead. And so they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, this would be where Jesus was buried, they did not find the body. They didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, because I said Jesus tried to prepare them, they didn't totally get it. So they were wondering about this, and suddenly two men in, uh, in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Now we've said that Jesus was dead. We've said that Jesus was buried. And now they're being told that Jesus is alive. Everybody say this, say Jesus is alive. All right, let's try this. Jesus was dead. Jesus, was dead. Jesus, was buried. Jesus was buried. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Now, there should be a certain amount of enthusiasm that comes with that last one. <laughs> exactly, that Jesus is alive. Because if Jesus was dead, and we looked at this in 1 Corinthians during the time when we were uh, getting prepared to give, that if Jesus is still dead, our faith is, is useless. Our faith is completely in vain. We are wasting our time if Jesus is dead, but he ain't dead. That's good English right there. That's good English. He ain't dead. He's alive. 
He's alive. And so it says in verse number six, he's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you? And he was trying to prepare them. While he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. He must be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven. Those would be the eleven disciples who were remaining. Remember, Judas had betrayed Jesus, had given Jesus over, and then ultimately he had went and taken his life as well. And so there's eleven disciples, apostles that are left. And so they go back, these women who had gone to anoint Jesus' body with the spices and the perfumes. They went back to the eleven and to the others and they told them what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene. And you say, why did they list the names? Well, you know that their account was going to be refuted, right? You know that there were going to be people throughout that time and throughout history who were going to say, oh, that, the resurrection didn't actually take place. The reason, I believe, why they gave actual names is because this was taking place back then. This was a real historical event. This really took place. And you could really have gone at that point to Mary Magdalene. You could have gone to Joanna. You could have gone to Mary, the mother of James. You could have gone to the others. And you could have asked them, did this really happen? You could have gone to the 11. And you could have said, did this really happen? You see, a lot of people say it was just a hoax. Believe it or not, there are people still today, who are trying to perpetuate the lie that what took place in New York City and the Pentagon on 9-11 was nothing but a hoax. Do you realize there are people out there that try to convince others that that was a hoax? If you didn't realize that, there are. And, and it's like, wait a second. You can go and you can talk to thousands of people who experienced what took place on 9-11 in our country. And you can ask them, did you really see those towers fall? Did you really see the Pentagon? You can go and there are eyewitness accounts. And it's not like some one random eyewitness account. You can go and you can ask thousands of people, did that really take place? And see, that's the neat thing about God is that he knows that there are going to be skeptics all throughout history who are going to try to doubt the truth of the resurrection. And so it's like, hey, listen, you can go and you can talk to Mary Magdalene. You can talk to Joanna. We're going to look in 1 Corinthians 15. There's going to be over 500 people. You can go. You can talk to them. A little bit later in uh, the passage we're going to read here, there are two people walking along with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. You can go ask them. This wasn't something you could make up. This was the news of the day. And so it says, here's who they were. Uh, they went and they told the apostles, but they, di they didn't believe the women. Now, you might say, why didn't they believe them? Let's be honest. This was a crazy, unusual event that was just taking place. Okay? Now, I know how it is to be a parent, and some of you do as well. And sometimes your kids come to you and they tell you some things that you're like, I don't know about that. There's got to be more to this story. I can remember my daughter one time. She has a vivid imagination talking to my wife and I about these turkeys she do saw doing backflips in her yard. And I'm like, now listen, okay, Kylie, you're taking gymnastics, but I'm not sure that those turkeys have been taking gymnastics, okay? But she's telling us this. And, and the funny thing is, we've talked to some people about this, and they say, you know what? There are sometimes that the turkeys will get together and they'll kind of like start kind of going at each other and it will almost appear as if they're doing backflips and so whether she made that up or not I'm not real sure but nevertheless there are some things that are hard to believe and so whenever these women come back and say Jesus ain't there and that's the, that's the words they use by the way Jesus ain't there and they're like man we don't believe this like this this seems hard to believe we saw him die and Jesus was dead we know that he was placed in the tomb we saw it happen, and now you're telling us that Jesus isn't there. So they didn't believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. Again, understandable. Peter, however, however, and this is just Peter. If you know anything about God's word and about the disciples, Peter's the one. He's probably going to be the one that's going to get up and do something bold. And so Peter, he gets up, and he ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen, linen lying by themselves, and he went away uh, I think I actually have this verse on the next one. Sorry about that. And he went away wondering to himself what had happened. So he goes in, looks, no Jesus, but there's the stuff he was buried in, and he wondered what had happened. So this is all taking place. Jesus was dead. Jesus was buried. Jesus is now alive. And it's not something that normally took place. And so they're all wondering what in the world happened. Here's a really, if you haven't read this account in scriptures, this is awesome. Now that same day, 
two of them, talking about two that were followers of Jesus, were going to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Now, how awesome would this be? You're walking along, you and a buddy. And all of a sudden, there's this other third guy that comes and he's walking along and you get to have a conversation. You don't know who he is, but you're just walking along. Now, it's Jesus. You just don't know it's Jesus. If you knew it was Jesus, you'd probably stop and talk to him. You'd probably uh, uh, do a little bit more than just walk along. So they didn't know who he was. And he asked them, well, what are you guys talking about? What are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. Now, again, these are followers of Jesus. What did we say? Whenever Jesus was put on the cross, whenever he was placed in the tomb, their hopes, their dreams were shattered. It ended there for them. They're downcast. What are you guys talking about? And you can almost just see, walking along, just, just distraught. And so they say, one of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened uh, there, talking about in Jerusalem in these days? What things, he asked, talking about Jesus asked. Well, about Jesus of Nazareth. Now, again, Jesus says, has hidden himself from them. He, they don't know who he is. You haven't heard about Jesus, this one from Nazareth? <laughs> he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. Everybody say Jesus was dead? Jesus was dead. But we had hoped, we had hoped that he was the one, the one who was going to redeem Israel, and what is more, it's the third day since all of this took place. In addition, crazy of all crazies, check out, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see. And he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things? This is Jesus talking about himself. <laughs> Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter glory? And beginning with Moses. Now this would have been the most awesome sermon ever. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I'd sit through that sermon. I'd walk through that sermon, whatever they were doing. They're walking along the road. I'd walk a little farther to hear Jesus talk. All the way from Moses, all the way up through, he explained to them what was being, what was being done. All about himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. Uh, you, know, you know how it is. Uh, if you're at someone's house and you don't like what they're making, you act like you're not hungry. Uh, if you... Uh, are with a group of friends and they decide to go somewhere else and you are sick of them, you act like you have to go home. Um, all of those things. And so Jesus acted like he had to go a little farther. All right? But they urged him strongly, stay with us. Uh, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Now this sounds like what? Sounds like the Last Supper, doesn't it? He's taking the bread, he's breaking it, he's giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while uh, he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And this is what was happening. I knew it was him. Yeah. Doggone it. You knew it was him too, right? You know how that was. You've been somewhere where you're like, is that, is that? I knew it was him. And that these guys, they're like, we've had this time with Jesus and we didn't even know it was him. Now here's the deal. Some of you have lived most of your life and Jesus has walked along your life with you. Whether you're a follower of his or not, I want you to know that Jesus has walked along through your life. Not in relationship with you maybe because you have rejected him, but I want you to know that today can be a day when your eyes are opened where you can see for the very first time that this Jesus is not just a Jesus of history. 
This Jesus is not just some radical that people talk about in worship. This Jesus is one who was dead. He went to the cross to pay for your sins. He went to the cross uh, so that you could have new life. He was buried, and then he rose from the dead to conquer death. This Jesus who has walked along, who you maybe have not recognized until this very moment, the Holy Spirit is opening up your eyes and you're saying, you know what? I need this Jesus too. So it's very possible that you're here and you for the very first time are saying, you know what? I get it. I get what Jesus has done. And so you see that happening with these guys. They're like, doggone it, I knew it was him. And so they got up. They returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together. And saying, it is true. In other words, what these ladies have been telling us, they ran to the tomb, or they went to the tomb early in the morning. They found that Jesus wasn't there. They ran back to the 11. Remember, Peter got up, and you'll find another account that some of the disciples went with them as well. They run to the tomb. They find that it's true as well. Some of them have actually had an interaction with Jesus at this point as well. And then you see that these two are coming back, and the two told them what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. This is not something that has been made up. I want you to think about this for a second. An event, uh, well, let's just take the bombings that took place in Belgium this past week. We can sit here or stand here all we want and say that didn't happen. But it happened. And there are many eyewitnesses to the event. And you can sit here and I can stand here today and try to say the resurrection didn't happen. But one of the neat things was is that when the, the, these scriptures were originally written, there were many people still alive who could verify the validity of what had taken place. You can't make up a lie and then try to sell it to those who know that it's a lie. I mean, some people try it. You guys have seen politics, right? You know, I, that's the truth. And the truth of the matter is this. People try to do it. This is a really true event. Check out 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 with me for a second. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse 4. Uh, Paul is, is writing and he's saying, here's the deal. Here's what has happened. This Jesus was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And then check this out. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. And, and this is... If you have your Bible, open it there, check it out. 1 Corinthians 15, most of whom are still living. In other words, go ask them. Did you see Jesus alive after you saw Jesus dead? Everybody say this with me. Jesus was dead. Jesus was buried. Jesus is alive. Now I realize we can't right now go and ask eyewitnesses. But there's a reason why we have God's word recorded for us. Because back then they could. And, they, and it was written, here's the deal, just go ask the people. We can't make this up. Uh, there was a, a historian and he said this. Uh, he said, uh, the, the resurrection proclamation could not have been maintained in Jerusalem for a single day, for a single hour, if the emptiness of the tomb had not been established as a fact for all concerned. You couldn't just say, oh, yeah, he's raised, he's there's an empty tomb. What would they do? They would go to the empty tomb. And if the tomb wasn't empty, they would say, it's a lie. Now you remember in another gospel account how they paid the soldiers who were guarding the tomb to make up a story saying that the disciples stole the body. <laughs> now, what we just read, does it appear as if the disciples have any clue as to why Jesus is not in the tomb? <laughs> no. They're amazed. In fact, they didn't believe the women who said that Jesus wasn't in the tomb. So if they had taken the body out of the tomb, they would readily say, yeah, we, we know he's not there. Okay, listen, we took him. No, but they're shocked. And Peter's so shocked that he gets up and he runs and he's like, by golly, he's not there. Listen, here's the deal, folks. I said it all the way back at the beginning. Your sin, my sin, separates us from God. If nothing is done about your sin... It's just the truth of scriptures that you'll spend an eternity separated from God in a place called hell. Now, the, the thing is this, and you probably know this verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. In other words, he loved the world so much that he sent his one and only begotten son that whosoever, anyone, believes in him 
will not perish but have everlasting life. Truth of the matter is this, is you need Jesus as the Savior from your sins. I don't want to see anybody walk out of this place still lost in their sin. I have a son, I have a daughter. Many of you in here, I know you have children. And you know the love that you have for your children. God had no less love for his son. And I want you to think about this for just a moment. He had no less love for his son, and yet his love for you and his love for me and all the world was so great that he was willing to send his son to die for you and to die for me. I'll admit something real quick. I'm selfish. I wouldn't give my son for you. On my most unselfish day, I wouldn't give my son for you. But God in his love gave his son for you. I want you to know he loves you. I want you to know he wants a relationship with you. I want you to know that if you've gone through 10 years of your life or 50 or 70 or 80 years of your life without Jesus, you shouldn't go another minute without him. He wants you to be his adopted child. And he says, all, it needs, all you need to do is come to me in faith, acknowledging that, I ha that, that Jesus has died for you to pay your sin debt. Peter, when he preached at Pentecost and thousands came to know Jesus, said this, seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. It's a true story, folks. It's a true story. You're going to leave this place having made a decision. Some of you have already made the decision to have a real relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've been in a relationship with him for a year or for a month or for 50 years. I don't know. But some of you have already made a, a choice to have a relationship with Jesus. Some of you today need to say, you know what? I have never bowed before an almighty God and said, Jesus, I need you as my Savior. I place my faith in in you, in your sacrifice on the cross. I can't pay my own sin debt. If I try to pay my own sin debt, I'll be separated from God for all of eternity. Some of you today need to say, I'm going to accept Jesus. Like I said, you're going to make a decision. Some of you might say, uh, I want to consider it more. And if you do have questions, I'm going to have some folks up here. We'd be glad to answer some of those questions. The truth of the matter is this, regardless of how much fact we can give you, it still takes a certain amount of faith to say, I am going to trust in Jesus as my Savior. And so if you're at a point of saying, I'd like to consider it more, we would love to talk with you. But I would also say this, don't wait too long. Jesus is, an ex is extending an invitation today. Some of you are saying, you know what, I don't ever really intend to make this decision. If you have a, a Connect card, and all of you should have it, can you just pick it up real quick? Kind of wave it in the air so that I see that you have one. If you do not have one, um, just kind of put your hand up real quick. We'd like to get one um, to everyone. If you don't have one, there should be one somewhere near you. All right, on the back of this uh, uh, worship program, there's a Connect card. And on that Connect card, it has an opportunity. We'll pray for you. But it also has an opportunity to say, my response today is, and there's an A, B, C, or D. Does everyone see that? If you see that, say, I do. There's an A, B, C, or D. Here's what I want to do before you fill that out. And you'll, you'll, you'll grab a pen, put your name on the front if you can. Uh, just fill that out on the back. But before you do this, I want everybody to take a moment. Just bow your heads with me for a second. As you have your heads bowed and your eyes closed for a second, everybody say this with me. Say, Jesus was dead. Jesus was, Jesus was buried, and Jesus is, alive. Jesus is alive. Some of you today need to begin a relationship with Jesus. I'm going to pray a prayer, and listen, it's not going to be the prayer that saves you. It's going to be the intent of your heart. If you are one of those people that say, you know what, I want to accept Jesus today, I want you to pray this prayer in sincerity. 
But here's what I want to ask everyone to do. I'm going to pray, and even if you already know Jesus as your Savior, I want you to pray this prayer out loud with me. It's not going to make you saved again. Once you place your faith in Christ, that's sealed for you. But I just want you to pray this prayer out loud if you've already accepted Christ, and if you haven't and you want to. Listen, if you don't want Jesus in your life, if you don't want a relationship with him, I don't want you to move a muscle, I don't want you, your lips to part, but if you would like to say, I want to place my faith in Christ, today realizing he died for me he was buried and that he conquered death i want you to pray these words with me and like i said if you already know jesus pray these out loud with me as well say dear jesus, dear jesus i need you, I need you. My, sin my sin separates me from you, me from you. But, today, jesus, but today jesus i place my faith, place my faith. in your sacrifice in your death, your burial, and your resurrection. Come into my life, Jesus. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to tell this resurrection story. It is not a story, some mythical thing. It's the truth of what you have done for mankind. So God, I pray for everyone in attendance today. Lord, that they, would, that they would be diligent followers of you. Lord, we're going to sing to you. We're going to lift our voices to you. And we want to tell you, thank you. Because you have made a sacrifice that we could not have made. You have paid a price that we couldn't pay. And so we just say thanks. I want to ask you, you still have your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Anyone in here today, nobody's looking around, you say, I prayed that prayer today for the very first time. Would you just put up your hand? I just want to see for a moment. Anybody say, I prayed that prayer for the very first time today. I asked Jesus into my life. Anyone at all? How many of you then would say, you know what? I've prayed that prayer before, but I need to start living as a called up disciple of Jesus. Would you just throw up your hand real quick? Okay, I see those hands. Lots of hands. Lots of hands. Last question. How many of you that say, you know what, I, I, I'm a follower of Jesus, know at least one person who needs to know about him? How many of you would put up your hand and say, I know at least one person that needs to know about Jesus? A lot of people. Last question. Will you tell them? How many of you that raise your hand and say, I know somebody who needs to hear about Jesus will also raise your hand and say, you know what, I will reach out to that person. Whenever I see them next or the coming week, I'll reach out to that person. Will you put up your hand just real quick? Wow. God, I pray for these folks who say that they're going to reach out. I know that you have gone to great lengths to bring us to you as your children. Help us to be willing to take this step and reach out to others. God, I pray you do a mighty work in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite the prayer team.